Hey, good morning guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Hope you're all doing well. This video is gonna be very different. I am practicing a dry run for an upcoming talk for the Chandler Amateur Radio Club on uh, my communications platform. So if you're new to the channel, you may wanna skip this video. It's gonna be about an hour long, but uh, I'll get a lot of value out of this practice run. And also there are a few people following the project that kinda of wanna hear uh, what it's all about without actually having to go to the event. Um, also, I don't know how the GoPro is going to do for an hour, and I don't want to deal with the background audio at the event, cuffs, farts, and people leaving um, in and out of the room. So let's get started, and uh, we'll start the clock now. And uh, MCOM Tools is a field expedient software platform that I have been working on now for about a year on and off, and it has morphed and changed considerably. But uh, the goal for that project was to provide uh, digital communications for uh, emergency situations and also for a lot of the work I like to do in the backcountry. So there won't be death by PowerPoint. Uh, I decided to tell a story for this format today and uh, to do that I need to tell you a little bit about myself and the journey of MCOM tools so you can understand where the project is coming from. So first and foremost my name is Gaston, amateur call sign KT1RUN and I have been a lifelong backpacker uh, almost 35 years now and a trail runner for about the last 10 or so years. So a lot of the work that I like to do is influenced by being in the backcountry uh, since I discovered ham radio. Now I'm also a software engineer and my journey in software engineering also has influenced this software project in particular. I started out as a Unix systems administrator, so I have a lot of systems experience, uh, especially on the Linux, Unix side of the house. But uh, early on in my career, I uh, kind of shift focused by sheer accident and went into a big five consulting where I was focusing on content management systems, uh, search integrations, and basically building uh, really large scale websites. And the one problem that all of those uh, companies had was they had data in these different locations and silos throughout their organization and enterprise. So they may have uh, inventory data for vehicles, they may have uh, the trim information, uh, the packages available, uh, marketing content, and they needed a way to basically bring all that content together and they'll deliver it in one experience. And I've been doing that now since I think 2007, 2008 uh, in the uh, biotech industry, uh, life sciences, entertainment, automotive, uh, high-tech, and when I got into amateur radio, I realized that there was fragmentation on all of the amateur radio tools, just like those same data silos. And I realized that it would be great if there was one simple experience, and that's really the direction that MCOM tools took. Now, I'm also a self-proclaimed prepper. I started about eight years ago, I think, after a really bad experience in Southern California, while uh, about 100 miles from the home. And uh, I started out prepping like I think everybody else does. I started with uh, an EDC bag, a 72 hour bag, uh, bag for the vehicle, and started with uh, water preps, uh, food storage, medical, um, personal defense. Um, but I had one gap and that was communications. And the only thing that I found that would solve that problem was amateur radio and that was back in 2017. I uh, had a hard time getting into the hobby, didn't make a contact for almost two years, uh, but I think in 2019 I finally made my first contact and I have spent the last couple of years really focusing on communications for preparedness. Now COVID hit uh, in 2019 and we were temporarily living in California, uh, yeah we were in the People's Republic. We left Arizona, we were there for about five months and um, just couldn't deal with the situation and the volume of people. So we bought an off-grid property, or mostly off-grid. We just get electricity out here. And um, that presented some new challenges. Uh, so, you know, imagine it's 2022 today and we still don't have cell coverage where I live. Um, internet is very unreliable. We have a microwave dish that sits on a roof and it points at a station, uh, I think about 10 miles away from us on our south. And that goes down at least three times a week. Sometimes it's a five minute blip. Other times it is um, upwards of 24 hours. And we primarily get our Wi-Fi calling. So modern world, we don't have anything but electricity. And even that is pretty unstable. Our cell phone is unreliable uh, if the Wi-Fi goes down and no access to the internet. 
So not everybody has this problem, but it has made me very sensitive to um, how to better prepare in the absence of having all of this tech. So the solution at this time was amateur radio. Uh, we had quite literally moved in 2019 with the RV, uh, got to our property, and we had a three-day window for our furniture to arrive. So we really had nothing. And it has been two years since I had been licensed at that point, and I still had not made my first contact. So I had nothing to do. So I decided to uh, fire up uh, the Baofeng UV5R, the little HT, and I got on one of the local repeaters and threw up my call sign. I said, KT1, RUN, I'm a new ham, and looking for my first contact. And I hear, WB4, ZKA, good afternoon. And uh, that was my uh, Elmer, uh, Mike now. And uh, that's really what uh, kept me in the hobby. I was about to throw in the towel at that point. So I progressed a little bit on voice using repeaters, simplex, primarily working with the HT, moved into a mobile install on the rig. And then I really wanted to get into digital. And I had a very difficult time with digital, uh, trying to figure out how to interface a computer with the radio, getting the sound volumes to work correctly. Um, every program was a little bit different to configure. Um, I knew I wanted to do a little bit of APRS. I had heard about these things called FT8, JSA Call, FL Digi, WinLink, uh, but all of them seemed like a really big undertaking and I struggled. So I tabled all of the digital stuff for now and kind of just stuck to uh, FM voice. So we've got the Tonto National Forest right behind the house. It is just 400 meters. We have private access to it. And I discovered something called Summits on the Air, or SOTA. And it's an activity whereby amateur radio operators throughout the world will basically load their radio, their antennas, and stick them in a backpack along with their water, food, and support gear. And they'll go to an approved peak, set up the station, and then they have a group of operators called chasers that will try to work that station. Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a point-based uh, system. Uh, but the point is I got to go outdoors, test out my gear, and by virtue of basically doing field day every single weekend, um, I learned quite a few things about operating off-grid and offline. So this was my first peak. It was Whiskey 7 Alpha stroke Mike November 061, also called Ruin Ridge. And it was fairly hot. Uh, we weren't quite in our summer months yet. I think it was only about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I had about just shy of a six mile round trip and a little over a thousand feet of gain. So I get up to the top and I uh, plug in my, uh, or deploy my FT818, it's a five watt QRP radio. And I find that um, it's a contest weekend and there's lots of chatter on the air. And I can't break through. These guys are running full power in a lot of cases. Um, and I have spent all of this time carrying this gear up this peak uh, just before the summer, over 100 degrees, and I'm almost devastated at this point. Um, I end up making one contact uh, all the way down in Florida from Arizona, uh, but it was not enough to activate the peak. So I figure out, okay, how do I avoid this problem of, I've gone through all this effort to set up this remote station and nobody knows where I am. So what I found was there's something called the Automatic Packet Reporting System, or APRS. And it is found on a VHF. And uh, the purpose, uh, not the purpose, but one of the major features that hams like is that it provides the ability to beacon your location. So if you have another APRS compatible station, you can see all of the hams in your area and have their GPS location. I was never really interested in it from that perspective. Uh, but what I did find is that APRS has another set of capabilities and you can actually, uh, since the emergence of the internet, it can be bridged with the internet. Uh, there's a series of stations called iGates or internet gateways that interface with radios and uh, they're deployed across the country and we actually have one about uh, 30, 40 miles uh, from my location. So I decided to buy this little device called a MobiLink TNC2 and connect it to my handheld and then interface it with my phone. And the solution to that problem of not being able to activate the peak or let someone know I was there was solved by a service called APRS to SOTA. So I could quite literally turn on my radio, put it on the APRS calling frequency, 
uh, connect to the MobiLink, and then I could send a special message to APRS to SODA, that's the station ID, in a very special packet. And the packet format was your peak designator, Whiskey 7 Alpha Stroke Mic November 061, space, your frequency, let's say I wanted to do uh, two meters, so I would put in 144 decimal, uh, you know, 410. Uh, your, see, I'm forgetting already the, um, the format. Uh, the mode of operation, FM, your call sign, and then a comment. And I was able to spot myself, send this out there, and all of a sudden I had a pileup. I had people uh, across the country who are monitoring this, uh, these spots, and they were able to see exactly which frequency I was on, and all of a sudden I had like 30 contacts uh, not long after my first attempt. So I get back home and my wife says, hey, I didn't know really where you were. I was thinking about you spent a lot of time back there. So there's no cell reception. Uh, but I know that APRS had worked for spotting me on the SOTA Summit. So did some more research and it turns out there's another APRS gateway called email-2. Um, and also SMS gate. We'll talk about that one first. Uh, SMS GTE is a gateway interface whereby, again, I can use my APRS compatible station, put in uh, the station ID, in this case it's SMS GTE, and I could put a small two-part message, which basically consists of the app symbol, uh, the phone number, and the message. So I tried that the next time I did a peek, and I basically did at my wife's phone number and on summit safe. Well, when I got back home, she was super excited. She shows me her phone and she got a text message from me. She didn't know how to reply at that point, but we had one way communication where I didn't have any cell coverage, but she did. Later on, I showed her how to reply back to me and we use that technique now quite a bit. Uh, there's also another gateway called email-2 that allows you to send a short email message, less than 63 characters in total. And the cool thing about that one is that it'll actually also take your GPS location render a map and include that in the email. So my wife now has a small picture she can show the sheriff when um, she knows the, the crows are circling one of the nearby peaks and they need to find my body. But um, these three gateways with APRS completely changed my perspective of amateur radio. So sometime later I decided to um, upgrade to my general class license. I wanted additional privileges and um, Actually, no, I, at this time I had not uh, decided to upgrade. I tried to try the, uh, the WinLink global email system because I liked the idea of sending email over radio. And one of the challenges I had with um, WinLink, again, was the hardware, the software, the configuration. And once I kind of figured all of that out, um, I realized that it was a lot of steps to fire up the computer, tune the radio, find a station that I could actually get into. Um, and then there was a practice net that I found called WinLink Wednesday. And it is a, a net that has basically, I think almost a 24 hour window. And you have a very specific format to check in over the global uh, WinLink email system. Uh, there's a, a person you have to send it to. There's a very specific subject you're looking for. In my case, I think it's the Ohio WinLink uh, and then there's a format for the body, and uh, in our case, I don't use uh, what they call a, um, ICS forms. Uh, I just use the CSV delimited format. Um, so I finally got most of that working uh, reliably, but then I realized, well, I can't remember all of these different formats and how to switch modes. Um, like I have the three different formats for uh, APRS, now I have this check-in protocol for WinLink, and these start to stack up pretty quickly, and unless you do them often, they will decay. Um, so let's talk about the station. Um, so I was using a Raspberry Pi 3B Plus at the time. I've got one right behind me here. It's a low-powered device, and I have it running off a little battery pack. Um, at that time, I was actually using the SignalLink USB, which is uh, right behind me. It's this little box here, but the box is almost the same size, if not larger, than the Raspberry Pi and is somewhat brittle. It's got delicate knobs on it. And then I was using a large HF rig. This was the Yaesu FT891. 
I forget what it comes in at, but it was significantly heavier than my smaller radio, uh, the 818. Um, and it requires more power, and overall that starts to kind of weigh into uh, my ability to go farther distances and higher distances when I'm climbing a peak. Then I was using my um, iPad mini, so what I would do is uh, enable a Wi-Fi hotspot on my Raspberry Pi and log into this over a virtual desktop connection and start up all of the various services. Um, one of the services, uh, so actually I lied. So at this point I was a general class license holder and I was able to do HF. So for HF on Linux or the Raspberry Pi, uh, the protocol that most people use is called RDOP. And there's a specialized modem for that in software that you need. Um, and it's different than some of the other uh, software you need for the other modes. So kind of file that one away. And then there's a WinLink client called Pat. So that for the most part represented my entire station. So I had all of these different components. I had all of these different modes. I had all of these uh, protocols to remember. Uh, and you have, bear in mind, I'm not sitting here at my shack where it's nice and comfortable and climate controlled. Well, it's not climate controlled. But, um, yeah, you know, I'm typically sitting on a rock. Sometimes there's rain. Sometimes it's 114 degrees. Um, so doing all of these steps is not conducive to the method or being able to communicate. That's the ultimate goal. I don't want to have to worry about all of these steps. So in 2021, um, there was another chance encounter that changed my way of thinking about emergency communication. And the gentleman from Tennessee, another ham, Seth, has this company called Armorlock. And he says, hey, I've got these um, frames you can put on your radio. And you don't need to, you know, put all your radios in the dry bags and connect cables. This is a full system that is designed to run your radio vertically. In fact, I have one right here. We'll talk about that one in a bit. And you put it in a bag and you run power and even the antenna is relocated uh, on the frame. So I'm like, ooh, that's, that, that changes things quite a bit because at that point I was bringing a, let me show you here. I was bringing this aluminum table so I could put all my gear. I had uh, between 1.5 and three liter dry bags where I had all of the different equipment, the radio, the hand mic, the batteries, the cables. So it would take me a good 10 minutes to set up just kind of the, the station that you're seeing here. Um, so this new setup, I quite literally only had to open up the strap, connect my antenna, and then connect the Raspberry Pi. You can actually see it there on the picture. So uh, that was the first major uh, change that I made was going from the table to moving to a pack frame. Uh, much more field expedient. Second thing I did is I got rid of the uh, signal link USB and I went with this small uh, USB sound card. Uh, I went with the Sovereign USB. I think it was like $5 online and then I spent $30 on a data cable that would work with it. And it worked well enough. I still have about three of those on my various kits. I also went from the FT891, that 100 watt HF only rig, uh, back down to my Yaesu FT818 ND. So I had a little over two pounds in the radio, plus the frames, plus the bag. Uh, so kind of the story that I'm building here is you can kind of see how I'm trying to turn this more into an appliance and a confined uh, system that can be quickly uh, deployed. So field expedient is gonna come up quite a bit in the design. I also got rid of the uh, iPad mini, and the way that I did this, uh, we'll talk about in a second, was by writing some software that uh, allowed me to connect to the Pi just using a little web server that I put on here and uh, my phone. So rather now than carrying, even though it was a small iPad mini, now it's just able to pull up my phone and basically turn on and off the Raspberry Pi and do various digital um, modes. And then, like I said, the, the big shift here uh, from the, in the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus was my secret sauce, which is the whole point of this video, and that's MCOM tools, which makes using a whole suite of amateur radio applications 
much more easy to use um, and really uh, handy when you're in the field. So uh, for field day 2021, MCOM Tools version 0.1 was created. And as you can see here on the application, uh, it was just a simple web interface. And I wanted to do at this point, I think it was two or three things. First, I did not want to have to take my iPad to do a remote desktop connection and start up a bunch of services. And after I was done with all that, I didn't want to have to shut it down. So there's a big button at the top with the toggle. I can basically turn off the entire Raspberry Pi just by hitting that big button and then just kill the power. Um, modes, I had three modes in the original prototype and it was WinLink RDOP, so I could do WinLink email messages over HF. WinLink packet, which took me some time to get working, but it was supported, so I could do WinLink over VHF and UHF. And APRS, the ability to uh, send those text messages to my wife, send the small emails, beacon my location. And the goal here was I didn't have to remember how to open up the terminal, run the startup script to start all of these various services. So everything was just big, fat, dumb gorilla pushing buttons on my phone. The next piece that I wanted to solve was, okay, now that we've initialized the Raspberry Pi for WinLink, I don't want to have to remember all the formats. So I created these little uh, templates, uh, if you will. So let's say that I wanted to uh, share my field day status with everybody. Uh, at home, I created a small template where I had the full two list. I had about 30 or 40 uh, subscribers that wanted um, uh, status information. And then uh, the subject in this case was field day status safe. I had about uh, four variations of that, uh, of not safe, call the sheriff, um, you know, heading back down the hill, uh, you name it. So these were all user defined uh, pre-canned messages so I didn't have to even crack them in the field. And then the payload uh, was actually kind of cool since I did have uh, GPS capabilities with the Raspberry Pi, I came up with these small replaceable tokens. So I could do curly, curly brace, GPS, curly brace, curly brace, and it would inject into the message my actual GPS location at the time the email was sent. Uh, same thing with altitude, temperature, all of that good stuff. So um, you, you can kind of see the value here if I could quite literally turn on my radio, turn on the Pi, pull out my phone, open up the web interface, switch the mode, press the button, and under usually two minutes, I was completely done with the digital contact I wanted to make. Um, all right, here's an, another good example. So uh, APRS, in this case, I want to now send a text message, an SMS text message to my wife where I don't have text message capabilities or any cell infrastructure. Switch to APRS, and for my two field now, I select SMS gate uh, from the dropdown, and then I put in my, uh, in this case, the alias, at wife, and my message, and now I have like sent her a, a streamlined message through um, the cell infrastructure going through another radio that got put on the internet, goes through whatever system it needs to go, she gets the text message delivered from the carrier, and we have communication. Now version two is the subject of this video, or not the subject of this video, another feature I found much later on. I got into a two meter single sideband. And I found that uh, for two meter single sideband, there were stations located all around me. The farthest one was about 110, 20 miles from my location in Tucson. And I was having a hard time with my omnidirectional antenna. And I found a directional antenna, uh, got a two meter 440 uh, Arrow 2 Yagi. And I realized, or I didn't realize, I, I knew that if I had pointed that antenna at that station's bearing, I would get a much better signal port and that my communication would be of higher grade. Um, also, I would be able to have better reception quality as well. Now the question is, I'm out in the field. I don't have access to internet. Even if I knew their call sign, how would I know what to do and or how to look them up? And then how would I figure, be able to figure out their bearings since I don't have access to QRC? Well. I'm a search engineer, right? So I said, no problem, this is an easy engineering solution. We'll just download a copy of the FCC database that's publicly available. 
I will parse that, basically just read that file. I'll take their first name, uh, the city, uh, the state, their zip code, and I believe that was the only information I took. And I only took a subset because you have to remember, I'm trying to target a very small device that has limited storage. This is not a full-fledged desktop computer with lots of memory. So that was one data set was the FCC database. Now, how do I figure out their location? Well, there's another uh, public database called GeoNames that you can download. And GeoNames has a zip code to latitude, longitude piece, as well as altitude. So I took all of that into account. And while it wasn't perfect, I was able to basically enter into my little uh, search application on MCOM tools. The remote station's call sign, I would get their first name, uh, was it location, uh, their state, their grid square, I would actually calculate that and fly, but I would get their bearing and the distance. So all I would have to do at this point is actually take out my Garmin Instinct and take the compass and orient the beam at their location. And this completely changed my world. So at this point, well, what have we accomplished? Well, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I have no cell coverage. I can hear a lot of stations. I'm picking up their call signs. I have the ability now to fully, 100% offline, look up that station and find where they're located roughly. Um, again, I'm using their zip code as the representative location, but again, it's easier for me to deal with the 40,000 some odd zip codes in the US uh, in terms of storage rather than looking up you know, 900,000 um, uh, latitude and longitude coordinates for, for hands across the country. So maybe in a future release I'll do that. So <clears throat> by this point I had spent a lot of time uh, doing summits on the air and the channel started to grow a bit. Um, oh yeah, I have a YouTube channel by the way. And um, this gentleman, George from Pactenna, uh, was developing uh, these really cool uh, antennas that would fit in the palm of your hand uh, and fed half waves for 20 meters, link dipoles, random wire antennas. And he sent me one uh, for review. And it changed my world uh, operating, and I've been using the Pactenna uh, field antennas now, uh, you know, since then. Um, but he also has a podcast called The Ham Radio Workbench. And not too long ago, he was talking about the CF20 Tough Book as being a cool field notebook. Uh, so I kind of put that in the back of my mind and didn't think too much of it. Went out on a number of soda activations over the summer when we were in excess of 114 degrees. And the number of failures I experienced with a Raspberry Pi uh, change the direction of the channel of tools, not toys. These things failed almost all the time. Uh, it just can't handle those temperatures. Um, the SD cards were, or the SD cards? Why am I at a loss? Um, the little, <clears throat> whatever, the um, micro SD cards uh, were failing quite a bit on here. Uh, same thing with the cable. And in general, these were now starting to become unreliable. So even though I took, went up to the field and had success in the past, uh, these weren't real great out here in the summer. So he was talking about the CF20, and I've bought three of them since then. And this is my new target platform for the reference implementation for NCOM tools. And the cool thing about this is, uh, as of right now in 2022, uh, there was a vendor on eBay who has these at just... 49 uh, price point and they are ultra rugged uh, IP 65 rated mill standard 810G uh, laptops. My model's from 2008, but I gotta tell you, it has enough horsepower. It's got, uh, I think, four CPUs, maybe two, and it has 16 gigs of RAM. But the cool thing about this uh, is that it actually has two batteries. There's one battery in the keyboard dock. It's a 2600 milliamp hour battery, and there's one on the screen. What makes this even cooler is that this 3.9 pound machine is now roughly half the weight, and you basically now have a tablet. In my case, it's a Linux tablet. Uh, this model also has 
uh, integrated LTE and GPS module, so I don't have to worry about consuming the one USB connector that's on the screen to do a GPS dongle. Really cool stuff. Um, it also has a 1900 by or 1920 by 1200 um, screen resolution, which now changes things for me. Uh, before I was limited to my phone and that screen. Now I have the ability to have something that is uh, much more water uh, resistant and dust proof. Something that is field proven and used in industry and certainly not a toy like the Raspberry Pi. So I decided to hit the reset button and start from scratch on the MCOM Tools project, which we're calling, I guess it'll be version one for, for everybody publicly, but I think of it as version two. So <clears throat> MCOM Tools right now in its current state is actually targeting Linux, specifically Ubuntu, and specifically uh, this is the target platform because I absolutely think this is the perfect uh, solution for emergency communications for field use. <clears throat> in the picture there you can see I have gloves on and you can see the little tiny icons. So there are two takeaways here. First, a lot of the um, ham radio software was, as, while it's fantastic, was developed at a time where uh, everybody had a pointing device, uh, with mouse, and the interfaces are very small. They're not really designed for touch. Uh, which is a problem. The second issue uh, that I had was I sweat a lot. Uh, so my iPhone frequently is a failure point for me too when I'm sweating um, and it barely works with gloves. The CF20, gestures work with sweat, gloves. Like I said, this is not a toy. Um, if I wasn't able to find one for $500, I probably would buy a new one, um, uh, even though it's, they're considerably higher. So some of the design decisions were was I wanted to be able to have a platform that would work in full sunlight with gloves, with sweat. Offline first. Um, all of the testing I did with the offline call sign database, uh, the ability to uh, not or to operate and use all the capabilities of the software in the absence of any infrastructure was absolutely another core principle I wanted to bring over. And then the same unified experience of being able to switch modes, not having to worry about how to use um, each piece of software. I just wanted to say, today I want to send an email, or today I want to send a text message, or today I want to find another station, and not worry about how to do that across multiple different applications. Um, I'm also moving towards the direction of an appliance. Uh, this quite literally is my entire field station. and it takes almost no time to deploy. It's less than two minutes for me to get on the air and start doing digital, and then I can shut it down just as quickly. So I'm calling this, uh, what we call in the software industry, a reference implementation. Uh, MCOM tools will be available for other platforms like the Raspberry Pi much later, but right now I am really geared towards Linux and specifically the CF20. So I'm going to have to uh, change gears here to jump into a demo. We'll film out separately for, uh, for the YouTubers. All right, after 30 minutes, we're finally able to see the current working version of MCOM tools. Now this dashboard or this application is very different than the original version, and it is designed to allow for larger screens like the CF20 tablet or desktop computers, but also will work with smaller devices like your phone. And the first screen here is a dashboard and there are a series of widgets, starting with the time widget. This will give you local time as well as UTC. The mode switcher is a little bit different. Uh, this time I've opted to make it very simple for the average operator to use. It no longer asks you whether you want to do WinLink packet or WinLink on HF or APRS. Instead I have I generalize that to allow the operator to say, hey, do you want to chat with another operator that's running MCOM tools? Do you want to transfer some data? Uh, typically, this will be uh, sharing a location and some other payload on the tactical map. Uh, the ability to send an email, whether it's through APRS or uh, using another uh, mechanism like WinLink. 
Uh, file transfer also allows us to transfer files. Uh, it uses FLDigi under the hood, but I've hidden all that. Uh, same thing with text messages. This will allow you to toggle the necessary features to uh, start up uh, APRS that you can send a SMS text message. Your location will give you a number of different formats or views into your current geo location since it is assumed that you have a GPS device. For networking, we have the ability to uh, connect to a Wi-Fi um, network or enable a hotspot. So if you're in the field, you can have other devices connect to the machine running MCOM tools. Under system, we have system telemetry. Uh, it has real-time CPU uh, temperature information, battery, battery status, uh, disk and memory utilization. Uh, services running will likely move into a uh, advanced menu and basically shows you under the hood what's running. So for example, uh, the chat uh, mode relies on FL Digi. But in general, I don't want the user to have to know what's running underneath. Again, the goal here is simple. We have quite a few options on the menu. Uh, we're going to go through this pretty quickly. Most of them are not yet implemented uh, in this version as of yet. So chat has a very simple interface. It will use FL Digi under the hood and will allow you to send very simple uh, messages to another station and then show you chat history. Uh, it will also have the ability to have user defined macros. So right now this is just a mock-up and something that is not working. The uh, data transfer is kind of interesting. Uh, it will basically allow you to transfer CSV data sets. And there's a very big um, MCOM use case. Uh, most of the data sets I have right now are from public service events uh, where I have been supporting wilderness um, like races, for example. And we want to be able to send various user-defined uh, sets of tabular data or CSV data. So you can create a new data set at the bottom. Uh, you can import another data set and you will be able to share it. Again, this is just a mock-up, but all of this works uh, basically leveraging FL Digi behind the scenes. Email is the same way. Uh, I've talked about this at length with the original version where you can select a predefined uh, template type and it would fill in the to field, the subject, and the body, and then you can go ahead and um, uh, basically save that uh, or make changes. And then in the case of WinLink, you would post to an outbox you can save uh, an email template if you want to use it for later, and then you can automatically send the email. So this area also is not connected, but I've already proved the concept with the original version. So let's spend most of our time talking about the Tactical Awareness Map, or the TAM. And the TAM was something that is 100% offline. It uses a local OpenStreetMap server uh, to basically allow you to render tiles. So you notice the first thing it has done is it has geodetected my location and placed me on the map. Now to make this uh, kind of a fun experiment, I have a wilderness activity that I am going to support this weekend, and I have already loaded in a number of stations. So what we're gonna do is tab to the next station, and we can go ahead and zoom in. And the interesting thing about this is that uh, I have created a pin or location for the start finish line. I have the latitude and longitude as well as the altitude. And the distance here is the distance from my station uh, to this location, which is 30 miles, as well as the bearing. So I can use the directional antenna to lock on on its location as well as see the grid square. And then I also have a very crude way of calculating line of sight. So if my station in the upper right hand corner here, uh, that's a distance of about 30 miles. Uh, if we're able to have a uh, line of sight, this will be in green, otherwise it will be in red. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other cool actions. For example, I can go ahead now and let's say that I want to use this as my new location to see if I can actually talk to the other stations that will be part of the event. Uh, under actions here, this is uh, the move to operation. And now I have moved to this GPS coordinate and I'm right here. Uh, what's interesting now is if I go ahead now and switch to another station, either using the tabs here at the top or right clicking on a pin here, 
I can see now the distance from me being at the start finish to this pin is now 1.46 miles. Um, I have the elevation of the Ford Canyon first aid station here. And let's just zoom in a little bit more. Perfect. And then I have the bearing, so if I had my Yegi, uh, we can go ahead and do that. The other feature I've added, which is not fully baked, is the line of sight has an overlay to allow you to train it over time based on your geography. So it's going to allow me to say, hey, did you make a contact with that other station at 1.46 miles? That station was Ford Canyon 8 station. Uh, it'll dynamically populate the time and date and then use a thumbs up or thumbs down. So over time, the intent here is I can start to train the system um, to let me know if the line of sight calculation is um, on or off or uh, if it's accurate or not um, based on the math. And then I can also go ahead and log the radio, the antenna, the power, the mode, the band, and the frequency, and that'll allow me to build a historical table of the equipment that I'm using that I'll use for a feature much later in the future. Um, it'll also give you what I'm calling the max line of sight, which is the big green button value, but it also gives you a D-rated line of sight, which is a way of backing down um, by some factor, uh, it's basically a percentage, to have it be more realistic. Now, the, everything you're seeing so far now is 100% offline. The uh, only piece that is online is this graph that gets pulled in from, um, hey, what's that? And you can actually see here that there's an obstruction between here. So it'll be interesting to see when I work the event if I can actually talk to that station. I think I will, given that it's not very far. Uh, so you'll be able to save this in a future version. Uh, if you need to make changes, you can go ahead and click Edit and make any changes as well as add notes. Uh, let's go ahead and add a note. So we'll say, um, I don't know, uh, maybe my friend Mike is working that station. You can see here now it's actually on the bottom here. There will be another option here to share this marker with another station running MCOM tools. And this is part of the data transfer capabilities that I'm building on top of FL Digi. So you would turn on your radio, go to the same shared simplex uh, digital frequency and hit the share button and it would send the packets across. Um, so we can bounce around now between some of the, the other stations here. Uh, that would start finish. Waddell stations out here, and again, it recalculates uh, the distance and the bearing. Um, there's also the ability to uh, go ahead and delete something. Uh, let's not delete these ones right now, but let me drop another pin maybe where this golf course is. And now I can drop a pin there, and then I can change this to say, I don't know if that's a golf course, but we'll call it a golf course. All right, perfect. So those are some of the um, uh, the basic abilities for uh, entering them, some geolocations. Now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, an advanced feature that I built for the call sign uh, database. I think the first thing I want to do now is also go back to me, and I'm going to go back to my actual GPS location by hitting this globe, and it should recenter me over here. Now let's find a station down in Tucson, K7 EME. And you can see I'm way up here, and it has zoomed us out to the, so that we could see the Tucson area. And that distance now is 103 miles. What's funny is that um, I can actually make this contact. So the line of sight calculation um, is based on different elevations. So if you were to take a look at this, you can see that this is my height above ground, and then the, here's the height of the other station. So it thinks they're it doesn't take a path analysis into account like, hey, what's that? Um, it, this is really designed for closer proximity um, contacts. But the point is I can go ahead and search for any call sign. Let's look at my Elmer, TPP4ZKA, and there we go. So I could do this all along. I can see, hey, where's my buddy Chris, who's another summit activator, and we can go ahead and click on Chris. Um, you can also see here we get their name, uh, what city they're in, and the state, as well as the representative zip code and all that cool information. Now let's say that we want to go ahead and uh, enter in a GPS coordinates. Um, I'm going to make one up real quick. I'm going to do, I don't know, 34, 
dash negative 112. I don't even know where this is on the map. And that's not a valid location because they don't have the decimal. All right, so it looks like it's just north of me somewhere in the Tonto National Forest. One thing to also keep in mind here is that the maps that I have cached and offline um, are really for the areas that I'm planning to work because the data set is fairly large. So if I were to put in my buddy Jason KM4ACK who's in Tennessee, you can actually see here that there is no map data. Uh, some people who saw this prototype have asked me to go ahead and uh, at least add the the zoom levels at this top level so that if, um, you know, at least I can see the state outlines and uh, some of the major interstates. So I'll be making that change. So I think that's it pretty much for the tactical application map. Actually, there is one more thing. I've also added this actions button so you can go ahead and open an existing map that you saved. Uh, so I was doing a water expedition uh, trying to navigate to a watering hole. Uh, this was my last soda activation. And then I had a endurance race that I was supporting last year. So this isn't fully baked, but it allows you the ability to save these actual maps for later use um, and open them. Um, and then I'm planning on adding support so that you can actually import a GPX file or export this current one as a GPX file. So lots of really interesting things going on there. Um, repeaters is another interesting one that is not fully baked yet. And uh, it'll basically allow you to have a cache copy of repeater book with some additional information, some secret sauce. And it will give you, uh, again, all the information here, um, your distance to that repeater, the bearing, and then everything you need to program that repeater. So there'll be some advanced filtering so I can filter by digital repeaters, uh, certain bands like two meter versus 440. So a lot of work is still needed here, but it follows a lot of the same design principles as the TAM or the tactical awareness map. Uh, the last piece here is a console. And this is basically gonna provide um, output of when services start and stop. And then you can go ahead and clear the console. So this kind of is the direction I'm going for MCOM tools. Uh, as you can see, uh, it still is some ways away from being complete, but I've already proven that it works with the first version that is very much tied to the radio. And the second version, I was concerned more about the user experience and making sure I could actually um, integrate things like a off-grid, offline uh, map. So at any rate, guys, I hope you've enjoyed this quick demo. And uh, for those of you in the room and not on YouTube, I'm happy to answer as many questions as you have uh, regarding all things MCOM tools. All right, guys, thanks a lot. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little demo. So we'll, we're going to do a little bit more of the uh, propeller head stuff here and talk a little bit about the architecture. So really quite simple. At the lowest layer there, we have what I'm going to call MCOM Tools OS. And it is going to be a, an Ubuntu custom uh, image that you can run off of a live USB stick. And at the time of this presentation, that is Ubuntu 10.1. Um, now, to interface the radio, uh, I have two modes uh, that I'm going to support. One is packet, and the other one is a sound interface. So uh, it includes all of the AX25 tooling for packet work. Um, and then for the sound device, I have opted for Direwolf as the software-based TNC. Directly above that, that layer, we have the ham radio application stack. And based on how I want to use and envision this platform, uh, right now there are just three applications that can give me the ability to do text messaging, keyboard to keyboard chat, email, position beaconing, um, sharing my position with other stations that are running the software, and that includes FL Digi. FL Digi is um, my go-to for a lot of the traffic passing, and then YAC for APRS, and then PAT for WinLink. And then my application actually is bundled in a jar file uh, with the front end and the back end. Uh, that's not really, um, we won't worry about that for right now. Uh, but basically it is a uh, single package that basically just runs off of Java, Java runtime and provides a small web server that you can connect to. 
Um, so on the laptop, for example, uh, I just opened the, I connected to the local web server, so localhost colon uh, 1981, the year I was born. So let's talk about milestones. Uh, this project is very slow. I have a full-time job and everybody's always asking me how I do all the things I do uh, between uh, backpacking, family time, uh, having a 40 hour a week job, uh, the YouTube channel, the software project. Well, uh, it's part of the reason why this project uh, should have only taken four months and now is over a year long. So April uh, 2022, uh, I'll be at uh, American Milsim. Uh, in a observation capacity, and uh, there's a few guys there that I want to give a tech preview to. The uh, beta, or the private beta, will be in July 2022, and that's mostly going to be testing with my local emergency, emergency communication group here in Maricopa County, as well as a couple of other YouTubers that completely get what I'm doing. Uh, the plan is for August of 22, anybody who has supported me, any donation, uh, will get in, included in the private beta, and that's on uh, buy me a, buy me a coffee slash the techprepper.com. And then uh, December 31st, I will hopefully be doing the first public release, um, and it will be free of charge. So if you guys want to contact me, I uh, have a few places, or if you want to learn more about me and what I'm doing, uh, first is YouTube. I have a channel called The Tech Prepper. Uh, Instagram, I post there uh, usually about three to four times per week on everything I'm doing. In fact, it gives you a preview of what I'm working on. Um, I'm not a big fan of Twitter. I find that everybody there is too pedantic and I hate dealing with trolls and uh, I just don't have time for that nonsense. But I'm there and I post occasionally there maybe once or twice every few weeks. Um, Website, uh, it's there, uh, www.thetechproper.com. Uh, there are usually some articles there that I'll, I'll write from time to time, uh, but there's not a whole lot of content um, at this point. Um, and then obviously, uh, buy me a coffee slash the tech prepper, and uh, that's just a place where I actually will uh, do lots of updates on the progression of MCOM tools. Typically, there, there are five minute short videos um, that are, uh, they're public if you find the link, but it's just a thank you I'm doing for the group that follows me there. And then I typically have a small newsletter that I'll send out for two weeks. So at this point, I'll take questions since we're on YouTube uh, and I'm talking at the camera. Can't answer any of those. So thank you. All right, guys, I'm the Tech Prepper. Be strong, be safe, and be prepared.